Amen. You know, the Bible says there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The precious, powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's just praise his name once again. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. And now let's open the word of the Lord. Open your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. We're, we're studying through the book of Acts about God's unstoppable quest to get the gospel to the nations and uh, the fact that we as followers of Jesus Christ are also unstoppable in the power of the Holy Spirit. The gospel of Jesus is unstoppable. We see in Acts chapter 8 how persecution couldn't stop the gospel from spreading that believers just went somewhere else, and wherever they went, they spread the word of the Lord. We see that cultural and ethnic and language barriers can't stop the gospel from moving forth. In Acts chapter 8, Philip takes the good news of Jesus into a very unlikely place known as Samaria. Many believe that it just wasn't possible for Samaritans to get saved, and yet the gospel broke down those barriers. And here in the last part of Acts chapter 8, we see yet another cultural barrier falling to the gospel of Jesus Christ when an African man from Ethiopia hears the gospel and is saved. Now, this morning the Lord has um, laid something on my heart, and and so I don't think I'm going to get much past the first three or four verses here. Because I'm just um, intrigued by something that we see in the first verses here of uh, of Acts chapter 8, verse 26. That is our text. Follow along as I read Acts 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. And the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. There are three characters in this episode here in the book of Acts. There's Philip. There's the Ethiopian man, and there is the Lord. And the hero of this story is the Lord. What amazes me and what intrigues me here as I watch all of this unfolding is is how God is drawing an Ethiopian man to himself. He has his eye on this man, but at the same time, he has his eye on his servant Philip and how God is going to direct their course and their paths to cross. I'm fascinated at how God can reveal his will and direct his servants so freely. There are a couple of incidences that happened this week that caused me to just really think about this this whole thing of God's leading and discerning the will of God. One of them came in the form of an email from a young man who grew up in our church here and went off to the Naval Academy and uh, became a Marine chopper pilot. And, uh, and he's been very successful at that for about 10 years now, but, but he, he, write, he wrote to share with me that he is sensing that God may be changing the whole course of his life, that God may be calling him to preach the gospel. And so he's struggling with knowing the will of God, discerning where God wants him to go. Should he he stay in the Marines and and, and enjoy the successful career that he has out before him for for himself and for his family? Or should he step out on faith and trust God that he's going to take care of him as he responds to, to God's call to give his life to kingdom work? So how do we discern God's will in situations like this? The other incident happened over the weekend when I got um, a text from a friend of mine who had been seeking the Lord and in serious discussions with a church about going to be their pastor. And this had been going on for months. And it seemed that God was just moving in that, in that direction. And then all of a sudden, 
This weekend, he finds out that that door closed, suddenly closed. And I, as I read his text, I could just sense the ache and the disappointment in his heart. Did he miss God? Why, where was God in all of this? How come we went all the way down this road feeling so good that this was the will of God, and then all of a sudden the door closed? I called him back and left him a voicemail. And I just said, listen, friend, just because that door closed doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. For the fact is that God may be saving you from something or he may be saving you for something or both. You see, whenever a door closes, you need to think about that. Is God saving me from something, sparing me from something, or is he saving me for something else better down the road? And so all weekend, I've been meditating on this, this whole thing of discerning and discovering the will of God. How do, we, how do we know what God is leading us to do? And, and, and I'm just fascinated here at how God was so free to move Philip around. You see, Philip was in Samaria here. He's part of an, uh, an amazing spiritual awakening that is happening in Samaria where lots and lots of people are coming to faith in Christ and God suddenly picks him up from that and sends him to a deserted, out-of-the-way place for one man. Now, how did Philip discern? How, how did this work? How did Philip know that this was the will of God for him to leave Samaria and to go to this out-of-the-way place in the middle of nowhere? Now, we don't have the benefit of knowing what Philip was thinking in all of this. But we, we do have a vantage point here to see how God worked to reposition his servant from one place to another, how God could move him so easily. How do we discern what the will of God is for our lives? How do we know if God is calling us to leave our career to go to do something totally different for the kingdom of God? How, how do we, what are we supposed to make of closed doors and, and the providence and the will of God in the face of doors that, that have closed? Maybe you're wrestling with a decision about, about your marriage and wondering what in the world are you supposed to do? I will tell you this, listen carefully, because you're either going through it right now or you will go through it soon. The fact is that all of us will have to face circumstances in life where we struggle to know the will of God. So how do we, do, how do we go about that? I want us just to learn from this experience here how God took an extraordinary servant of his and directed the course of his life and and. Uh, the, the sermon notes that you have in front of you there will be for a, a couple of weeks from now. But if you can find some place on your worship folder to scribble some notes, you, you, I encourage you to jot these things down. I, I notice that the angel of the Lord and the Holy Spirit and, and the command and the word of God all line up to say the same thing here in discerning, Philip's discerning of the word of God, of the will of God. We see, first of all, in verse 26, that an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south on the road, the desert road. So, so he hears an angel of the Lord said, go. And down in verse 29, then the Holy Spirit comes along as Philip is in the process of obeying, and he says the same thing, go. But the direction is more specific, go to, to that chariot and stay near it. But I want us to remember what has Philip engaged in all of this to begin with. For the fact is that Philip is doing what he is doing in response to the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he did not hear, perhaps he did not hear, personally hear Jesus say to the disciples before he ascended into heaven, go and make disciples of all nations. Go. Same thing he heard from the angels, same thing he heard from the Spirit. Jesus said, go. And so Philip is doing what he's doing because 
because he's been taught that this is what he is supposed to do. He is to go and make disciples, just being obedient to the word of God. So what you see happening here is the word of God and the spirit of God and the angel of God are all lined up saying the same thing. And it's very important for us as we are making decisions about the will of God for our lives is to make sure that we're picking up on those three factors and that they're in alignment with each other. So I want us to talk for a moment about these three factors in discerning the will of God. The first one is God's eternal message, his word. The first thing that we have to keep in mind in making decisions and discerning the will of God is God's eternal message in his word. God's word is the primary way that we know God's will for our lives, generally speaking. We know that it's God's will for us to glorify him in every way. It is God's will for us to put our trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and for the gift of eternal life. It is God's will for us to live a holy life and a humble life. It is God's will for us to serve him with every fiber of our being, to love him with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength, with everything we are and everything we have. We know that generally that is God's will for for all of us. But also God has very specific direction or dilemmas that we face in our lives and we can certainly find in the word of God answers to those questions but then there are some things where there are no specific commands or specific words that would guide us into making decisions but what we find in the word of God is wisdom that is applicable to every decision that we have to make if not a direct command or a direct exhortation or a direct teaching, what we find in the word of God is wisdom that will apply to every decision that you will ever have to make. The word of God is sufficient for that. And we must never forget it, that there is wisdom. And so as we saturate our lives with the word of God, we're going to have the wisdom that we need there to make every decision we have to make. So to make sure that you're following God's will for your life, make sure that you're in the word of God and obeying the light that you already have. And just know that God will never lead you by some other means that is contrary to the word of God and to the teachings of God's word. He'll, he'll, he'll never lead you to have an affair with someone. In spite of the fact that someone may say, well, my, my heart just says this is what I should do. Well, that's... That's not the will of God, and it's not the word of God. The word of God will never, will never lead you to steal from your employer, or cheat on your taxes, or anything else that is contrary to the revealed will of the Lord. And sometimes I hear people saying, well, my, my heart just tells me that this is what I should do. No, if it is not in keeping with the word of God, you've not heard from God. So there's God's eternal message in his word. But then there is also God's internal messenger, and that is his Holy Spirit. That's the second factor. You see, Jesus promised that believers would receive the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth and help them to understand the scriptures and help, would help us and strengthen us to live the life that we're called to live as followers of Jesus Christ. But then there are times that the Holy Spirit also gives very specific direction to us as it happened for Philip here so he's heard the angel of the Lord to go to this desert road in the south but as he gets closer he gets this specific direction from the Holy Spirit go and connect with that guy in that chariot so it's the spirit of God who gives him this direction this spirit this this very specific direction Now, Philip could hear the promptings of the Spirit of God because he was a man who was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, how do I know that? I know that from Acts chapter 6, a couple of chapters earlier, where the apostles came to the church and said, listen, we need men who can be involved in ministry to widows. And so this is what we want you to do. We want you to look for men who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And guess what? Out of the seven who are chosen, the second one to be listed is Philip. 
So he was a man who was known to be full of the Holy Spirit. And so as he was yielded to and surrendered to the control of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit was able to move him around and direct him so freely. And the Spirit of God is good to do that. As we are sensitive to the promptings of the Spirit of God, he will say to us, go here, go there, say this, say that. Don't say this. Don't say that. The Spirit is faithful to prompt us in those specific ways. But let me just say this. The mind that is saturated with the Word of God is more sensitive to the Spirit of God. Let me say that again. The mind that is saturated in the Word of God is more sensitive to the Spirit of God. So if, if I'm not walking with God in his word and in devoted prayer, then I'm, I, I can't expect that I can hear that freely and that easily from the Spirit of God when he says, I want you to go this way or that way. I want you to say this or say that. And so we need to be walking with God in his word and in his prayer. And then we can trust that the Spirit of God will give very direct and specific guidance along the way as we are making important decisions. And I have to say that there is a matter of subjectivity to this because I, there are times that I know that the Spirit of God is telling me to do something. There are other times I'm not quite so sure. But I know this also, that God is faithful, that he wants us to know his will far more than we want to know it. Believe it or not, God wants you to know his will more than you want to know it. So that stands to reason that he's going to move heaven and earth to show us the right thing to do. And so there is the eternal message of the word of God. And then there, there is this internal messenger of the spirit of God that we have as believers. But then there's one more thing that we see working here in Philip's situation, and that is external messenger, an external messenger in the angel of the Lord. You see, all of this starts for Philip when he hears an angel say to him, verse 26, to go south to the desert road. So God speaks through this supernatural agent called an angel. But does he still do that? Well, I happen to believe that he does. I believe the word of God teaches us that we can still expect that God is going to to work in this way. Now, we have to be very, very careful here. In fact, the Bible tells us that it illustrates this kind of supernatural direction. It, it, It advocates it, but it also regulates it. That is that we cannot look for some kind of external message from God that does not answer to the authority of the word of God. It all comes back to the word. Now, we're told, we're not told, actually, um, who this angel was or what he or she looked like. We do know that occasionally that angels take human form. There are several instances in the Bible where God's people were encountered by angels who looked like human beings. In fact, they didn't even know at the time that they were speaking to an angel. They just thought it was a person. Um, And so God, God moves in this way. And we need to be open to that. But we need to also be, be discerning when, when we sense that God is moving. That word angel means messenger. And, and angelic beings are just one form of God's external messaging that... Um, that he gives to to his people. Sometimes God speaks through external messengers like preachers and teachers and wise friends who give us godly counsel. Sometimes God speaks through messengers like that, external messengers. Sometimes God speaks through the external messengers of uh, circumstances. It's like my friend who had this door closed on him. That's one way you know very clearly what God's will is if you can't do it, at least now. That's a pretty good indication that God has something else in mind, that he's either saving you from something or saving you for something else, but that door is closed. God speaks through external messengers like circumstances. But listen, when you are walking with God and full of the Holy Spirit and devoted to prayer, 
that you can simply trust that God is orchestrating all the circumstances of your life. And even the things that seem painful and undesirable, he's using them to bring you to where he wants you to go. I love Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And don't lean on your own understanding. And, and maybe that's your problem today. Are you leaning on your own understanding? You're trying to figure this thing out yourself and it's just not getting you anywhere? Don't lean on your own understanding, but acknowledge him or look to him in all your ways and he will direct your path. He will make your path straight. That's the promise of God's word. And again, God is more eager for you to know his will than you are to know it, believe it or not. Now, what if you just don't have a word from God? Maybe there's, you've read the scriptures and there's, you don't find what you're looking for there. You don't you don't have a word from the Spirit of God to, to prompt you to do one thing or another. You've not gotten wisdom from any other external circumstance. What, what, what are you supposed to do? If there's no word, then wait. If there's no word, wait. Don't run ahead of God. How many of us have made huge mistakes in our lives when we ran ahead of God and didn't wait for him? When there's no word, Wait. Now, I want us just to pause and close this morning in this way. I, I believe that God put this message on my heart because he knew that somebody was going to be here today that needed direction from him about how to discern the will of God. And I'm so thankful that right here on the pages of Scripture we get to see a man who was so attuned to God that God could just move him around so freely and to know how God does, goes about doing that by his word, by his spirit, and by the other agents that he might bring into our lives to help us know his will. Would you bow your head, please? And this morning, if you have come to church with an important decision to make, And you, you really need prayer. You need support and encouragement as you're making that decision. I want to pray for you. So if you are making a very important decision, you're just dis wanting to discern the will of God about something in your life, you're very burdened that you do the right thing, I want to ask you, would you just stand, please, just with our heads bowed, but would you stand? I, I, I need God's direction. I need to know the will of the Lord in this. Just stand right now. I want to pray for you. God is faithful. God is faithful. Just stand if you want to acknowledge humbly before God today, I, I, you need wisdom. You need discernment to know his will. I want to pray for you. Father, I praise you today that you are a self-disclosing God. And the fact is that we would know nothing about you had you not first chosen to reveal yourself to us. And I praise you that, Lord, you not only disclose who you are, but you also disclose your will. It would be cruel of you to ask us and expect us to do your will and not show us what it is. So thank you, Lord, first of all, for your word. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And, Lord, we believe that and trust that. But we also thank you for your Holy Spirit who dwells within us, who leads us and guides us into all truth in Jesus, in the face of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you that you're powerful enough to orchestrate circumstances all around us to 
make the path clear. And so, Lord, I pray that for my friends here, these loved ones, brothers and sisters in Christ who are seeking your will. And, Lord, I believe with them that you will show your way. In Jesus' name.